Hi, this is Rob here, and I have uh, known Dr. Ian Evans almost my entire career in agriculture, and this is my first time on his uh, acreage where he has just a plethora of agricultural innovation going on. And uh, I just was in the west side of Edmonton. I thought I'd stop by. And Ian, uh, Dr. Evans, is a very famous uh, horticulturalist. Uh, the Evans cherry tree was invented by Dr. Evans. Now, But he is also, unbeknownst to most people, a champion lily grower. Ian, explain what you're doing here in the background here? Well, if you, if you look around here, I, I breed them. In other words, I found when I wanted to buy things, you know, when I had retired, I thought, what's the most expensive thing you can grow? Certainly not vegetables, certainly not uh, onions or certain kinds of lilies. Martigon lilies. When I first bought them, they were $35 and $45 each per bulb. So there's the bulbs that are underneath oh, the ground here, huh? There are thousands of bulbs under here. See, and these are all breeding lines, and I found I could breed them and grow them like carrots. In other words, you disregard the, the, the conventional thing, plant them six inches apart. If you look there, they're planted two centimeters apart, two millimeters apart, in fact. All the bulbs are jammed up together. And I can grow large crops of lilies, uh, and I can sell them for five to $15 each and uh, make quite a good living. In other words, uh, so where where do you where do you uh, where do you sell these lilies? I sell these lilies mostly wholesale because I don't have the time to sell them individually. <laughs> I sell them to the uh, Minnesota lilies, uh, the say, say the uh, let's say the Idaho Lily Society, the uh, Iowa Lily Society, the um, Pennsylvania Lily Society, the Ontario Lily Society, the Manitoba Lily Society. Uh -huh. I sell them both to the society at uh, five to fifteen dollars each, and they s retail them then from 10 to $40 each. Wow, that's amazing. So, you know. How uh, many lilies have you got growing on this whole farming operation oh, here? Many, many thousands, maybe 10 or 15,000. Really? It's money in the ground. <laughs> there you go. Well, and, there's and another thing stand, I didn't know about Yian. And they can stand any winter you want to. They, they, they do not suffer from cold winters. There you go. They're totally winter hardy. So it's perfect to be grown in our northern climates. Uh -huh. So there's a little tidbit about Yian. So Yian, what are you doing? This is a, is a small truss, normally the big bunches. This is a um, edible mountain ash. The berries are sharp, sweet. They make the best jelly you've ever eaten. Really? The well, I'm, I'm, I'm tasting this right now, and this is mountain ash, right? But it's sweet. So Sweet, sharp. Can you see the flavor? Mm -hmm. It's very loaded good. with flavor. Mm. Oh, you can make a fantastic jam out of it. Oh, that. it's very tasty. Now, I, 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 I've eaten mountain ash or tried. Oh. And they're awful. Yeah, wild ones are awful. See, the birds have eaten all the berries on this. I took a lot off, but see the bare stems? Yeah. The birds have eaten them off. They and know what's sweet. They leave the, <laughs> the bad tasting ones until later. <laughs> this is fantastic. This cedar here is from Kenora, Ontario, northern Ontario. And you know the one good thing about it? The deer won't eat this one. The western cedars, the deer will strip and eat. This is a northern Ontario cedar that they leave strictly alone. So it's uh, an anti-deer cedar. Well, it's an anti-deer cedar because uh, it was here when I had, before I fenced in the acreage, eh? It's, and they left this alone, strictly alone. It's quite tall. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's an Ontario one. It doesn't have the tall columnar shape, and it's the bushy shape. Why I don't see more of them, I don't know. I got this tree as a six inch seedling from Prince Albert, growing in the side of the road. Do you know why, what it is? It is not prickly. It's a balsam, and it's a beautiful tree. Oh, and it's soft. got a beautiful taste and smell to it. Smell, you smell the balsam, smell the, smell the beautiful smell of the balsam. Oh, it's very nice. That'd be a wonderful so, Christmas tree. Yeah, but why not grow one of these as a specimen tree? Because you can touch it, you touch these, and they're spiny. Look, these just, you know, touch them and these are blue spruce and they're miserable. They, they stick in you. This thing, no problem, a beautiful tree. Prairie balsam. These are apricot trees here and behind them you have peach trees. Uh, he's got pears on the acreage as well and all these different fruits. Uh, some of these don't fruit that well because the weather is not conducive. And over here, what is it you're doing here, Jan? Well, um, uh, yeah, here I got some selections of like Siberian cherries and small different things, plants. And in the background there, I've got what, what we call a prairie balsam. In other words, we grow spruce trees. We grow white spruce. We grow Colorado spruce. 
and they're spiny. And then nobody grows the prairie balsam, which is not spiny, it's soft leaved, beautiful smelling, uh, and yet for some reason, do you ever see it for sale? No, I don't know why. Huh. People in Manitoba in particular worry about black knot in cherries, it's killing the trees. What they don't know is that the commercial cherries, at least here, are immune. The ones like Gates, which is a very good uh, garden, sweet uh, chalk cherry, uh, Lee Red, Lee Black, they're resistant, no black knots. But the wild chalk cherries are all dead here. They've got total black knot, the May Days are killed off. But the, um, the uh, commercial chalk cherries and some species of chalk cherry are immune, so you just look for the immune chalk cherry. You mm. just don't say, oh, chalk cherries are wiped out. Hey, I got chalk cherries growing in the woodlot there that are not Pinus, I mean, Prunus virginiana. They're Prunus virginiana, some subspecies. They're immune to black knot. They don't get it. And uh, I've got them in the garden here. But the common chalk cherry, it's gone. Hmm. It's gotten wiped out. What are these? These are uh, apple seedlings. Uh, in a year or two, they're big enough to graft, eh? I grow apple seedlings or pear seedlings or plum, but the apples are the easiest to grow. And usually the most in demand. How many different varieties have we got here? Well, these are just all, just seed. In other words, okay. these are stocks from Siberian apples. Really? And I use these to graft, you know, the, the, the exotic apples. Yeah, Ian, you've had an amazing career. You chose agriculture. You're a semi bright guy for a Welshman, you know. Um, so, <laughs> why yeah, agriculture? Welsh, Welshmen are very bright, actually. Why agriculture? What, 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 what intrigues you so much about our industry? Well, you can find things and solve problems. I, I was hired by Joe Gerber when I, in Alberta, in this back in 1974. And Joe was the guy who introduced the rat control program. And in I, Alberta, yeah. In Alberta. Yeah. I was very impressed. And, uh, uh, as, as a consequence of working with Joe and taking that inspiration, I brought in the Dutch Elm Disease Control, the Black Leg Control Program, uh, the Fusarium Control Program, the uh, Ring Rot Control in Potatoes, which worked well until we turned it over. But, I mean, those things worked. And, hey, we solved ergot and wheat. Yeah. What's ergot and wheat? A copper problem. We solved things. We solved things like, like people saying... Oh, um, I, I, with, with ring rotten potatoes, um, either you got it or you don't. Hey, John Stendhal and I showed in 1983 that it could be carried symptomlessly to, uh, and not showing anything. And then some people spend a lifetime showing how much it carried. But I mean, we had the breakthrough, hundreds, tens of thousands of English, British, Dutch, Americans working on ring rot. Nobody had figured out that it was carried symptomlessly in some potatoes. You've been inducted into the Alberta uh, Hall of Fame, yeah. Agriculture Hall of Fame. It's a pretty big honor. And uh, you've, you've been working with us at Agritrim for many years now, and you're coaching young people. Why, why do you do what you do? Because you certainly don't need to do it. Why, why do you do it? I, I enjoy doing it, showing the common sense of things. You know, like why? In other words, when you're putting poultry manure safer on, on that, how much did you use? What, when, you, when you have a problem then with sort of high pH or low pH and then explaining your crop lodges because of a lack of specific enzymes, which are controlled by <laughs> copper. It doesn't lodge because of, of, because of, of, of a, a lack of potash. Potash is part of the system, but the, the reason why it falls over, uh, the reason why you get a particular disease, the reason why, why, um, why it's important, like with club root. I mean, I did bring that up in 1976, but oh no, we wouldn't have club root in Alberta. Uh, why we control club root and what sanitation can do. It, it's a, you don't sit back and wait for it to happen. You prevent it happening. Oh, that's awesome, Yaren. The thing I appreciate so much about you is that you never seem to have an opinion on anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing about agriculture. Uh, you can see it all over the world. It's a fantastic industry, and sometimes you don't have to go very far to find amazing things out about the industry that we work in. And I hope you enjoyed this issue of Agritrex. I'm very grateful to Dr. Yain Evans, Senior Agri Coach with Agritrend, who's been with us for a long, long time and sharing some of his wisdom and his knowledge today with me and with you on Agritrex. Until the next issue, talk to you later and happy farming.